Good evening. I'm Brent Taylor, the convener of the Speaker Program for Military History and Heritage Victoria. On behalf of our committee, I welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. Tonight, we're pleased to have Mark Latchford presenting Special Missions in Persia and Russia, 1917 to 1919. They're about the adventures of his grandfather, Colonel Ernest Latchford. But a little bit about Mark. Mark was born in Canberra and is a graduate of the University of Sydney with a Bachelor's of Arts in Modern History, Political Science and Economic Geography. He had a successful corporate career with the IBM Corporation, including senior executive roles in Australia, Japan, France and Hong Kong. Post-retirement, he is consulting in the public and private sector while pursuing his passion for history, biography and adventure travel. Mark has travelled to over 130 countries which included research for letters, letters to Lily Vale, the book he wrote about the special operations we'll hear about tonight. For a little bit of process before Mark presents, Mark will be answering questions at the end of his presentation. Um, I invite you to send a question via the chat message anytime up to and including the question, uh, a question time. You do this by clicking on the chat icon in the middle bottom of the Zoom panel and address the question to everybody. When the time comes, I'll read your question out using your first name. Um, Mark's happy to have the screens on, but remember that everyone can also see you. Please make sure your microphones are switched off and stay off. Um, by now you should be on speaker view and I invite, invite Mark to speak. Thanks very much, Brent. And uh, can I uh, just, Test that people can see my material? Excellent. I certainly can. Yep, okay. I can. Look, and thank you everyone for, for cutting out some time uh, from, your, uh, from your evening to, to hear uh, my uh, presentation or my story. Uh, uh, I'm really honoured that you felt, uh, thought this topic was of interest uh, to join that. Look, the, the genesis of this uh, lecture is, as Brent alluded to, a book I released last year, I, I sort of privately published um, a, a called Letters to Lilyvale. And the genesis of that book was actually um, several hundred letters that my grandfather wrote very methodically to his fiance from the moment he left Port Melbourne to the time he left Russia four years later. And I actually found these letters when I was still at high school when my grandmother died in, um, in North Baldwin. And I've been sort of lugging them around the world. And um, I then realized that uh, it, it's my grandfather's adventures, if you want to call them that, were worth sort of sharing with a wider audience. So over the last few years, I've been sort of pulling together this, this book, which um, includes these really easy to read letters, as you can see one posted up here. But uh, Ern was very disciplined in writing to his fiance every Sunday night, irrespective of whether he was in the mud um, of Passchendaele, whether he was in the snows of Siberia and, and the deserts of, of Persia. And these letters are really a magical insight of the lived experience. And, um, uh, and you know, now that I've done this, I'll pass them across to the War Memorial. Uh, but it, I also inherited this uh, a huge tranche of photographs, which I've used some of them for today's presentation, which are also in the book. And um, they too are now with the War Memorial um, for preservation. Uh, so that's the title actually refers to the name of the property where my grandmother, Linda Dennett, was living. Um, Lily Vale is still in the extended family. It's just outside Balan. Um, there's a photograph on the, of, the, of the property on the cover of the book. Um, so these letters that my grandfather wrote, uh, their destination was Lily Vale um, there. And look, and I found the most interesting part of my grandfather's story, at least to me, was the, the military segues he took, um, in particular to Northwest Persia with Dunster Force and, and also to Siberia. And uh, a number of Australians stayed on after World War I and went to Northern Russia. But as far as I've been able to determine, um, Ern was the only one who ended up in Siberia. 
And uh, I suppose that makes this part of the story uh, pretty unique from an Australian point of view. Um, let me see if I can page down. So what I'll, I'll briefly cover a little bit of Ern's background um, and touch upon um, his early days in Australia's fledging militia before the war. Um, I'll then talk about his service with the 38th Battalion um, on the Western Front, but I suspect the Western Front has been exercised quite a lot through this, um, this medium with this audience, so I won't spend as much time on that. And then I'll dive into the two sideshows in particular, as I call them, the Dunster Force experience in 1918 and then the Russian Civil War. And I'll also wrap up with what happened to Ern after the war, um, because that, I think, sort of is part of the story as well. Ern was born beside the Goulburn Weir uh, in that uh, cottage that's captured on this chart. His father was um, a, a nomadic stonecutter and a pretty dysfunctional family, to be frank. His paternal heritage is Anglo-Irish. His maternal heritage was, was Southeast England. Um, he was one of 10 children, um, but with a lot of uh, families at the time, uh, the father died young. He was crushed by a bullet dray up near Broken Hill in 1901. And uh, his three brothers died as infants and his six sisters were farmed out as domestic servants um, in their early adolescence. Ern, by chance, was basically fostered out to an uncle in Daniloquin. And it was during his education that he went up as a three-year-old. And during his education at Daniloquin was when he first took up one of his passions, which was um, shooting. He later went on to Uchuka, where his maternal family was, and ended up at Launceston, where he first got involved with the cadet system, then in place in Northern Tasmania. Um, he had a falling out with that uncle and moved in with some cousins in Auburn in Victoria and secured a job at Coles Book Arcade. And I like to think his exposure, not only during his education, but in particular working um, at Coles, exposed himself to some, uh, to, uh, a, literacy, a level of literacy that's reflected in his letters, but also his passion for, for literature going forward. During that time, he lived with his cousins, the Thakes, and some of you may know of his cousin, Eric Thake, who was a, uh, a renowned artist, including a war artist in the Second World War. Um, and Ern was uh, like a, an older brother to Eric. He joined the fledging Australian militia in 1909 full-time, even though he'd been a reservist uh, during his time at Coles Book Arcade. And about the same time, he met his future wife, uh, Linda Dennett, out at Doncaster, one of Linda's uncles. Uh, was in the, the Williamson was in the habit, Williamson Roads named after, was in the habit of hosting um, some of the um, those serving in the militia at soirees, and that's where he met his future fiance. Um, as I think many of you know, in the um, in the first decade of Australia, uh, the federal government uh, uh, adopted a compulsory training program for uh, teenagers and young men, and Earn was a key part of the training regime that was adopted. Part of that that involved suburban training, um, after work uh, for the people who were post school, and also involved participating in various camps. Ern was assigned to the cohort first at uh, Paran and Caulfield. And although he was hoping to be deployed closer to his girlfriend at the time, uh, Ballarat or Balan, he ended up uh, being positioned, uh, located at Ascot Bale and Essendon. And as Lenore Frost knows, you know, very closely um, working with the likes of Pompey, Elliot and so forth. Um, the highlights of his letters at that time were the camps up at Albury, which is the photo on the top right, but also down at Lang Warren, which is the photograph bottom right. Um, a lot of the time he was involved over and above the drilling and the training, but also dealing with the shirkers. And there was, um, considering this was compulsory, there was quite a lot of people who objected to doing this compulsory uh, training. They were often fined and the serial um, shirkers were often sent down uh, to the uh, Queenscliff to, um, some some uh, uh, camps to sort of 
uh, face punishment. The photo in the middle is actually taken at uh, Port uh, Port Melbourne uh, again uh, during one of the, uh, the uh, on their way to uh, the rifle range that was then at Port Melbourne before the war. Uh, when war broke out in 1914, Ern's letters reflected, I think, a lot of the um, the passion and enthusiasm that a lot of young Australians felt. Um, he was desperate to join the first cohort heading to Egypt and then on to Gallipoli, but he was held back, presumably because of his training expertise. Uh, the military hierarchy at the time felt that it was more appropriate for someone of Ern's experience to stay and train those that were to be the, um, the Anzacs in Turkey and beyond, which frustrated him uh, immensely, but it was uh, and he considered whether joining, for example, the Navy might be a better way to get involved. But um, luckily he stayed and trained that, that generation uh, departing. He was also um, pretty realistic about how the war would pan out. His early letters to his fiancee in 1914 said, this is not going to be a short war. It was going to be a bloody war, a long war, and truly a global war, which you know, it, it turned out to be. Um, he did, after nearly uh, 18 months of nagging, finally got um, uh, appointed to the 38th uh, Battalion, which was being formed uh, out of Bendigo. A number of his colleagues, including his batman, Bert Sheldrick from Essendon, uh, uh, were from his Essendon days. Uh, and so he relocated to Epsom Golf Course, uh, race course up at Bendigo uh, to participate as a second lieutenant in the 38th. Um, and they trained all the way through onto uh, Broadmeadow and eventually onto the Runic in, uh, in June 1916, aiming for Europe. Uh, the Runic took uh, the 38th via Cape Down and onto Cape Verde Islands, eventually onto England. And as with many of the battalions heading to the Western Front, they were located at Lark Hill in Wilshire. And this picture in the middle uh, shows, I forgot to put the red circle on, but shows Ern in the middle um, with his uh, platoon training at Lark Hill. Uh, a photo on the right, uh, which I did properly circle, uh, shows Ern with a couple of colleagues on their uh, one of two trips they took to London. It was, it was interesting throughout his life, every home Ern and his wife had was always called Lark Hill um, in recognition of his um, of his time in Wilshire. Uh, the photo on the right, on the left, by the way, was the crossing of the equator Neptune ceremony um, on the Runic. And uh, for most of the of the of the battalion, they never crossed the equator before. So it was a significantly bigger event than perhaps we would experience today. As I said, I won't spend a lot of time about the Western Front because it's a very well-documented um, uh, theatre of conflict. Uh, Ern and the 38th arrived in late 1916. And like most of the battalions, they spent time at the front as reserve for those at the front and in between on R&R. &R. Uh, his early days were spent um, often executing raids across no man's land. The picture in the, in the middle here actually is a souvenir he collected from the German trenches. Uh, it didn't say whether it was sitting alone on the trench, it was actually in the pocket of one of the, um, the German casualties, but he actually uh, grabbed that photo of, of the German troops, sent it home to his fiance uh, and is still with us. Uh, throughout his time at the Western Front, he wrote every Sunday night, even when under attack, he talks a, a lot about the impressive organization that Monash and Plumer put into Messines, which he fought with, um, he served uh, under and uh, participated in. And I think most historians uh, put Messines as the best executed engagement of 1917. Um, uh, in between, he had R&R &R often billeted out with French uh, French uh, uh, families, and he describes his his uh, views of French farmers versus 
uh, Victorian farmers um, and uh, some of the challenges. Uh, again, witty stories about um, some of his men knocking off the eggs of the French farmers without the French uh, farmers' wives ever working out what had happened to the eggs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it culminates in the battle, the third battle of Ypres, uh, and in particular Passchendaele, which in contrast to Messines, um, you know, I think is recognised as one of the most um, disorganised uh, and impractical engagements. Uh, Ern's mission, like uh, others in the 38th, was to strike forward. Um, he led his platoon. Most of his fellow officers were uh, obliterated in Passchendaele, and it was at Passchendaele that Ern earned his military cross for basically consolidating what was left of the 38th at Passchendaele as well as the New Zealand troops that were beside him for his salient and bringing them back the hundred yards that they had lost so much beyond. Um, look, uh, these photos that shows the George Cross, it's interesting the letters he wrote from the Western Front change in tone significantly. At Passchendaele, he lost his former uh, Batman, uh, he lost his brother-in-law, neither of them were ever found, and the tone of optimism was replaced by very brutal, very frank communications about the horror of that experience. I was frankly surprised that his descriptions got through the census, um, but they did. Um, I think there's only one letter from this period that didn't make it, they were numbered. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty good collection of the, if you like, the cadence of the soldiers' emotions in the Western Front. He even took a um, source, this picture on the lower right of a dead British soldier. I don't think he took it, but he was able to send that home as well. In between, he attended appropriate education. This is a picture of um, uh, a class that Ern attended um, behind the lines of, of, of Empire officers. You can see Ern fourth from the right in his slouch hat um, seated at the front. Again, I apologize for not circling it. In, in January 1918, um, uh, the Australian Imperial Forces and the other Imperial Forces were asked to provide volunteers for a pseudo secret mission to Northwest Persia, which became known as Dunster Force. And, and I'll, I'll now spend some time just talking about um, that circumstance. Um, look, throughout the First World War, as we know, the Southern fronts were not the main game in many ways, but they were certainly a, a preoccupation of the Allied leaders, whether it be their campaign to help Serbia, obviously the attack on the Dardanelles, um, the uh, failed attempt to push up to Baghdad by the um, British Indian Army that culminated in the siege at Kut in 1915, and later on the push through Palestine were all examples of the Allies trying to cut into the perceived weaker underbelly of the Axis forces, in particular the Ottoman Empire. But in late 17, with the implosion of Imperial Russia, the concern about Turkey's strength um, rose up. And there was a real fear that without the Russians keeping the Turks at check, um, the Ottomans may push through Persia and into British India, which in those days, you know, butted up to Persia, uh, you know, what is now uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, the, other reality was that from 1915 onwards, there was um, significant uh, ethnic cleansing of the Armenian and As Assyrian populations within the Ottoman Empire. And of course, the British had a significant presence in Kuwait and southern Persia, generating the oil that kept the war engine going. All these sort of realities triggered the construction of Dunster Force. And Dunster Force is named after the leader, Stanley Dunsterville, who was a British Army officer, actually the role model for Kipling Storky. Um, and so Dunsterville put together this force of 300 
best and the bravest from across the imperial forces. He requested 20 Australian officers, for example, and Monash um, provided um, uh, a significant number of these, including Ern Latchford, uh, Stan uh, uh, Savage, we were talking about earlier, and others, um, to, to lead this mission. And uh, early January, they left their Western Front battalions um, via London, where they were briefed in detail about Dunster Force, and then headed across France by ship to Egypt, um, escorted by Japanese destroyers, interesting enough. Um, after a, a brief detour to Cairo, they then boarded another ship to go um, around the Red Sea all the way to Basra in the south of Mesopotamia. Um, on the ship, there was a number of Russian officers to give them some training um, in the Russian language because the plan, among other things, was to really link up to the white Russian and non-Bolshevik forces that were still in the Caucasus around Baku. So that um, that's really how Ern and the others got to Mesopotamia. Um, just I'll share you a couple of photos. The photo on the top left here, Ern again is in his slouched hat, and this is the gathering of the Canadians, the Kiwis, the South Africans, some of the officers on Basra um, before they headed up the Tigris River. They spent a little bit of time at the military base of Basra, then they joined flat bottom boats for a long haul up the Tigris to Baghdad. Um, the photo on the right shows a picture of some of the crowds on the way to Baghdad. Um, and then uh, the troops uh, uh, were outside Baghdad preparing um, to cross the mountains into Persia. Uh, that light little uh, toy train was actually one used from the army base outside Baghdad into Baghdad. Um, it wasn't all play. They had tug of war. There's actually a photo of a, of, of a drag theatre show they put on. Uh, the photo on the right shows Ern at Baghdad Hospital. Um, he needed to have his teeth removed um, at some time during his deployment. Um, and uh, that's him in recovery there. After the troops got to Baghdad, they followed Dunster Force, who would already headed up through the mountains that border Mesopotamia and Persia. And look, um, and uh, look, Persia was fairly chaotic. The so-called central government in Tehran was particularly corrupt, um, dysfunctional, and as such, a large part of the country was ex ex uh, uh, experiencing extreme uh, famine. And the letters that Ern writes about the uh, the tragedy of the famine that he hit as they marched up from Baghdad on the way to Hamadan. Uh, these photos here show um, uh, the traverse of Dunster Force up through those mountains. Most of it was on foot. Um, they had a few T Fords, which had puncture problems, as you can see. Um, they also had a couple of armed cars, armored cars, uh, to take them uh, up and over through the high mountains that are the that lines the border between Mesopotamia and Serbia. Um, when when you uh, uh, this shows a couple of the uh, As Syrian um, refugees heading down from the northeast, the Ermia area, um, and um, and also some of the early training of some of the um, of some of the irregulars that they were missioned to do. Um, look, the other reality over and above an ineffective Persian government, they also had various Russian cliques, if you like, in play in the northern area. Um, they had anti-Bolshevik forces. They had Cossacks, um, and the idea was that Dunsterville, who had gone ahead with some of the force to, to link up eventually with the Russian the, uh, forces in and around Baku and the oil that was up there. And Dunsterville actually was successful in reaching Baku uh, uh, through some alliances with some Cossacks. But um, eventually the various Russian groups changed hands. 
So a chunk of Dunster Force, including Dunsterville itself, had to evacuate um, under first the pressure from Turkish forces coming up and later from Bolshevik forces. And a number of the Australians were with Dunster Force when he evacuated across the Caspian Sea. Um, another group of the Australian officers uh, were particularly focused on rescuing Assyrians and Armenians in the Amir area. And Stan Savage in particular was one of the officers who went up the roads towards Tabriz and Umia to meet up with these refugees and try and um, stop them being uh, massacred by the, the Ottoman um, forces and local warlords and so forth. Alan Stewart, another officer um, from the Australian cohort, was given based on his engineering de uh, degree, was given the mission to build infrastructure um, to try and support the, um, uh, the, the group of Assyrian and Armenians that were gathering in this northwest part of, uh, of Persia around Hamadan and Kangava. Ern's mission, leveraging off his experience, was to build an irregular or a guerrilla army out of Armenians and Assyrians. And for a large chunk of late 1918, that's exactly what he did. And here's a photo of uh, that first group of uh, uh, Assyrian recruits, um, pretty basic uniforms, even more basic equipment was made available. Um, they tried to apply standard, uh, you know, I suppose, uh, discipline protocols. This photo shows some discipline being applied. Um, very basic hot conditions during the summer. Um, one of the British responsibilities was frankly to feed many of the refugees because the Persian infrastructure was non-existent and the, you know, the, um, what we would now call as not-for-profit uh, uh, refugee agencies were few and far between. A few missionaries were there to help, but really it fell onto the Dunster Force. Um, um, to look after these huge populations of refugees. Um, as Latchford's uh, training built up effectiveness, they really weren't given much chance to be redeployed against the Turkish forces because just as this fighting force came into structure, the Ottoman Empire started imploding and uh, Ern describes, uh, the, if you like, the disappearance or the pulling back of the of the Turkish forces, and then the um, hearing of the, first of all, the Turkish arm, armistice in October 1918, and later the uh, the German armistice on the 11th of November. Um, he took this picture of Turkish officers um, who had surrendered as part and parcel of that armistice. So at, in November 1918, Dunster Force was disbanded. It was disbanded. It was actually disbanded a little bit before, after Dunsterville's withdrawal from Baku. So Ern found himself, like a lot of the Australians, um, uh, on the periphery of the war, but needing to go home, or expected to go home. And arrangements were made for the most of the Australian Dunster Force to make their way to Basra, and to join the the troop ships going to India and then from India to make their way home. Now, for a number of reasons, despite being engaged since 1915 to Linda, and therefore you would think a need to go home, Ern signed on for more. And he signed on to join the intervention that followed the Russian Civil War. And again, I think the Russian Revolution is well known, well documented. Um, uh, but I'll, it, it helps to put the context of this intervention. Obviously, the October or November Revolution was particularly seen as problematic to the Allies because the Bolsheviks were ambiguous about wanting an armistice with the Germans and the Turks, for that matter. And therefore, there was an immediate logistical impact on the, uh, uh, on the forces on the Western Front and other fronts. But there was also a real concern with the political leadership about what this worker uprising would mean. And there was well-documented concern in England, uh, in France, 
and even in, in the US, about whether the Bolshevik uprising would be a, a sign of a global uh, workers' rebellion. So, you know, at the end of the day, the leaders of Britain, Lord George Churchill, even Wilson in the US, were very concerned about the contagion that could be Bolshevism at the time. And that, in, in particular, fueled, um, you know, this intervention. It wasn't just a case of one side, the Reds or the Bolsheviks versus the former, you know, uh, imperial or social democrat armies. The Whites were um, a hodgepodge of different forces. There were some who absolutely wanted a return of the Romanovs, others who wanted a return to the social demo democratic regime of uh, Kerensky, and there were warlords who were just making use of the chaos to build up their own mini empires right across the huge country that was Russia. Uh, the intervention was in various locations. Um, the most documented one was the intervention of British forces in Murmansk and Archangel in the north. And that included quite a number of Australians who had decided not to come home from Western France. And two Australian VCs were awarded in the battles in and around Archangel. There were others up through the Crimea, um, and there was a number of Australians um, with a, a signals unit um, in that part of the world. We've also talked about um, Dunster Force being part of the intervention, trying to hook up with the people in the Caucasus. And then there was the East, the Siberian intervention. By this stage, Japan had been a, a pretty dormant ally to the Western allies. They had occupied German colonies in the Pacific. They had, um, had already been in Taiwan and Korea since 1895. And they were keen to expand into Manchuria, both formally and informally. And the Japanese were in many ways the vanguard of the intervention. The moment the Japanese decided to intervene under the auspices of helping the whites, the Americans said, felt they should intervene as well. And then the British Empire and the French also um, deployed forces um, into Siberia uh, all in the context of this intervention. The other complication about the Siberian intervention were the Czechs. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire, when it fell apart, had a significant number of prisoners of war in Russia, including the, the Czechoslovakian um, service men who were often conscripts. So there was a very large contingent of newly liberated Czech prisoners of war who were on a mission to get home to their newly independent country. Yet they couldn't cross the border in Europe. So they took the long way home. The idea was to travel on commandeered trains across the Trans-Siberian and home through Czechoslovakia, uh, through Canada and North America to their um, newly democratic country. And I'll come back to the Czechs in a minute. This photo, uh, the, the cartoon in the top shows actually white Russian um, forces, a uh, picture painted at the time. Um, this picture in the middle shows um, Canadian troops arriving um, in Vladivostok uh, with some sailors as part of the intervention. And the other photo is actually taken at Kutsk um, and again shows the mix of uniforms, which affects in some ways the mix of the forces involved in the intervention. Now, a key part of Ern's mission was part of what they call the Knox mission, which was again not a fighting mission per se but a training mission. The idea was to empower the white Russians and the various officers and troops who had evacuated to Siberia to fight the Bolsheviks. Um, they took the, the long way around. Um, so Ern made a decision when they were asking for volunteers for the Knox mission, not to come home, but to head to Siberia. Um, he went via India, Sri Lanka, or Salon in those days, Singapore. Um, he stopped in Hong Kong, and that's a picture of them playing some golf at Fanling, which is the rural 
a government house in Hong Kong. He went on to Shanghai and where he caught up with the military expat community in Shanghai, which shows him holding a baby. And then he went on to Japan and finally to Vladivostok, which was the entry point for most of the intervention into Siberia. And there's a picture of him at the bottom with an Australian family who was resident in Vladivostok, uh, the Forsyths. And John Forsyth was a fur trader. Um, and he and his wife and two kids were in Vladivostok throughout the Civil War onto the intervention. And John Forsyth actually stayed um, through the Bolshevik takeover of Vladivostok, although he evacuated his wife. And um, his son's a barrister, his grandson's a son, a barrister here in Sydney. Okay. Um, so I think uh, Siberia, the Trans Siberian Railway is, I think, known as the, as the, the backbone of, of Eastern Russia. It is really the only means of communication. Um, it was only finalized a decade or so before World War I. It was single track for most of the way, so prone to bottlenecks. But that was the route that Ern and his colleagues took to get to Akutsk. Um, they didn't take the slightly longer all Russian route. They cut across Manchuria through Harbin. Um, and the photo of the Manchurians or Chinese looking at them uh, is on this slide. Um, they traveled in old American boxcars, either within or on top. And I think this is probably one of the few times that cricket was ever paid, played in Siberia. And this shows Ern playing, um, playing some uh, cricket with his colleagues in either Manchuria or Eastern Siberia um, with the bemusement of the local Russians and Chinese and Japanese looking on. Um, a long way to go to Akuts, uh, several thousand miles. And that was to be the basis of Ern's um, deployment in 1919 in Russia. Uh, some of the troops that were uh, the British troops and others that were based in Akuts did go further east. They pushed on with the white Russians when the Ro white Russians were initially successful. They got to Omsk. Um, they actually reached Katerinburg not that long after the Romanovs were massacred there in late 1918, and they even made it to Perm. Uh, but Ern was, even though he volunteered to go further west, he he stayed in Okutsk for most of twenty uh, of 1919. I mean, um, a couple of pictures just to show the the hodgepodge of people. Um, Ern was very proud to wear his slouch hat. Um, but this group photo of the officers in Akutsk again shows a number of the Imperial Russian officers, but also some of the um, the uh, uh, the British Empire forces. Uh, and as you can see, the, the only one with um, a slouch hat is Ern. Uh, during the summer, they went outside Akutsk, set up a summer camp to train, and Ern was seen here with uh, some of his British colleagues. Um, and a presence throughout his time there were the Cossacks who were operating basically as independent forces away from the high command of the white Russians under Kolchak and others. Um, and they came and went as they felt pleased. And um, uh, that was part of the, the dichotomy of some of the troops that Ern and others had to deal with. Uh, they were initially in, in a Kut city itself which was, again, a mix of uh, aristocratic refugees from Western Russia, um, social democrat refugees, plus local peasants and farmers as well. Uh, because he arrived in late winter, it was still very frozen, and they were based in the town itself. Here's some pictures of his training, the, the white Russian officers in the town square. The picture at the lower right shows the Cossacks coming into town um, as they regularly did uh, to access munitions that were slowly being sent in by the intervention forces along the Siberian railway from Siberia. When the snows melted 
Ern and his colleagues went and built a camp and a rifle range outside of Kutsk to continue this training. And again, these are photos taken from that rifle range during the summer. Uh, the summer in Siberia is pretty uncomfortable. It's obviously not cold, but it's full of mosquitoes, dampness, um, and humidity. Uh, but they set about training this cohort of officers. Uh, a picture of Ern and his machine gun and his slouch hat is down the bottom left. Uh, and Ern was particularly pleased with his construct of this. He said it was based on the Port Melbourne rifle range, uh, uh, but uh, I've, I've got no evidence to confirm that. While at the summer camp, they lived in tents, and I actually have a copy of the of the shooting scorecard with me still, and I've scanned that in, and um, and the trainers obviously trainees obviously recorded their uh, their shooting prowess on something on this four or five page little booklet um, that was there. It wasn't all hard work in Siberia. Um, uh, they took time out because Akuts itself was not under great threat. The railway was because there was Bolshevik forces up and down the railway and often they disrupted the railway. They often attacked the railway, the trains going across. Ern tells a funny story that um, they captured one white Russian outpost an older imperial officer was captured. The Bolsheviks said, because of his um, uh, his service to the imperial regime, he should come back in the morning to be executed at nine o'clock sharp. Um, the officer uh, uh, took the orders, turned up at nine o'clock. The Bolsheviks had got on the grog and they didn't turn up on time. So he bolted away from his scheduled execution time, um, but a little chaotic. At that. But these photos, there's a picture of Ern um, in his car that took him out to the camp on the top right. You can see um, here a, a gymkhana put together by the Czechs. The Czechs descended on Akutsk on their way east. Um, they didn't fight as part of the white Russians, but they certainly were prepared to defend their trains and certainly to um, contribute some of their expertise. So this gymkhana, um, in the middle here was by the Czech forces and the photo on the top left shows the aristocrat, aristocrat and elite of Akuts watching that particular gymkhana. At other times, Ern went hunting and you can show him on the, on the far uh, left here heading out in the middle of winter for some hunting and on the right shows some hunting with the local Burat um, uh, indigenous tribes as well. And again, um, they built a golf course alongside the rifle range at Akuts to play a bit of golf. Um, but it was to end in late 1919. The white Russian successes to the West um, petered out. Trotsky in particular, running the Bolshevik army, um, had success in all directions. And over time, they pushed the white Russians back along the railway, and at the same time, the political leadership of the democracies felt it was time to get home. This was particularly the case with the Americans, who under Wilson was advocating uh, the, uh, the uh, self-determination of countries, uh, and especially in East Europe, and basically this translated into an American saying, it's time for us to get out of Russia as well. Uh, the British and French followed. So in late 1919, the Knox mission was disbanded and Ern found himself uh, heading back through Vladivostok, finally on the way home. These pictures are, are ones he either brought home or sent home. And they were taken, uh, one of them was when there was a Bolshevik uprising behind the lines in Vladivostok itself. Others were examples of Bolshevik atrocities um, with white Russian troops or just with the local population. Again, his letters are very brutal. There doesn't seem to be any censorship um, either from Persia or from Russia. And he describes quite accurately the horrors of the war. I, I included this letter of appreciation. 
which was a thank you letter from one of the white Russian generals um, to the British mission in Akutsk and including um, CCing Ern and his colleagues, thanking them for their, their, their work they did in 1919. So um, Ern headed home finally, uh, nearly uh, four years after leaving Port Melbourne. Um, but because he'd been in the militia before the war, he didn't have an alternative career. Most of his colleagues did. They either had family businesses or they had um, other careers. Ern had no option but to try and stay in the military, he thought. He took a demotion. By this stage, he was had been promoted in Western France to a captain. He took a demotion to warrant officer and was deployed to the School of Musketry, which then became the Small Arms School in Ranwick. Um, and he spent most of his career with the Small Arms School, eventually becoming chief instructor and then CEO. It relocated to Bungilla um, near Albury during the war and eventually to Seymour. He did go back to the UK for further training in 1923 um, without his wife. So she must have been getting pretty frustrated with this. Um, he was recognized with an MBE for his services in training the next generation or two of Australian military in 1938. He did eventually marry his fiancee, Linda Denon, in Ballarat in 1921. They only had one child, my father, uh, Kevin, in 1927. And uh, probably inevitably, Kevin um, joined the military uh, through a pretty traditional um, Duntroon uh, uh, process and graduated in 47. Um, after Earn retired at 60 in 1939, he served as a Supreme Court associate um, to a number of Victorian Supreme Court judges through about 1960. His retirement was cut short um, when he had a, a, a stroke and he died in Heidelberg in 1962. Uh, so that's the story of Earn Latchford, um, his military career, um, and in particular, the time he spent in Northwest Persia and in Russia. Um, Ern was recognized after his death. Uh, Latchford Barracks at Bungilla is obviously named after him. The Latchford Galleries at the Singleton Infantry Museum is named after him. And there's even a Latchford Street in Theodore in Canberra. Um, so he was recognized perhaps after, uh, long after his work, but uh, I, I certainly think his adventures in the sideshows of um, of World War One um, were pretty unique, and the fact that he documented them so well um, uh, makes us all uh, blessed or privileged. Um, I'll now open it to questions. I think um, here's a, a snapshot of his medals, uh, which I have, um, and as I mentioned up front, uh, uh, this grew out of me compiling his letters and writing a book around them. Uh, which you're most welcome to access if you're interested um, in hearing more of the story. But Brent, I'll I'll stop talking in my monotone and leave uh, open up to any questions. I think we have well, some time. Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say a, mon a monotone. I found it very interesting. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, are there any any questions that people would have? You have right up. I uh, put it said it on chat. I'll I might start. It it seems to me I didn't know much about the Dunster Force or and particularly the incursions into Siberia, it, it, it seems to me that they were sort of too weak to have really done anything. I mean, did they achieve anything at all? Um, they just didn't seem to me to have enough resources to be effective. Well, uh, certainly the Siberian one was really um, uh, you know, a bit like interventions in subsequent conflicts. Uh, it, you know, it, th there was never enough resource to make, I think, a difference the white Russians versus the, the Bolsheviks. Um, look, it's hard to predict whether Dunster Force um, and also the, the presence of the Indian army in Baghdad um, act really did stop the Ottomans. Um, you know, the Ottomans were struggling in, in keeping the Palestinian front, you know, at the same time. So some could argue that um, without Dunster Force, the Ottomans wouldn't have likely pushed into India or not, but that's 
the luxury of hindsight, I suppose. I suppose they didn't know it at the time. But yeah, 300 men aren't going to stop a concerted Ottoman push to India, I would argue, too. And similarly with the white Russians up in um, uh, Siberia. Uh, not the white, yeah, but the, when the Bolsheviks came yes. through, it was inevitable that they wouldn't do anything. Uh, Peter, Peter Fielding. You, well, you want to do a chat or do you want to put your mic on? <laughs> I'll let you, I'll let you speak, Peter. I've turned on chat if someone wants to ask there too. Oh. No, we can't, we can't hear you, Peter. You're still on mute, Peter. Yeah. Is that any oh, there you go. We can hear you yeah, now. Peter. I just say, Mark, very, very interesting and uh, well done. I'm probably the only bloke in the group that's been to a Kutz, so uh, I can speak from experience. And I can assure you, all those photos were taken in the summer because we, we were there in October and it was about minus 30 degrees. It's not a very, very pleasant yeah. place. It's Mark, the, uh, one of the claims to fame of a Kutz was that. It was the route that they got most of the Russian gold out of Russia, the imperial gold. That's right. 70 tons. Did your, did uh, your uh, grandfather have any, uh, mention that at all? Or did he have any involvement in that? No, no not, not apparently from the, the letters. Um, I've read about the evacuation of that gold through Manchuria and, uh, and also some of the, um, uh, the the bodies of the Romanovs that were massacred, uh, not not the imperial family itself, but um, uh, Grand Duchess Elizabeth, for example, and others were were uh, carted out along the same route um, after they were discovered. Uh, but no, uh, I don't believe that Erd himself was involved with the transit of that gold. Uh, Thanks. Um, a Kutz, I, I actually went to a Kutz during the Soviet times and I thought I'd go exploring and it was in February um, to see if I could find anything from that period. But I, I was sort of followed by, by dodgy looking um, Soviet officials. So I didn't discover much at all. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a tale of, uh, of two seasons there, I must admit. Um, uh, Are there any other any question any other questions? Brent, oh, Mark, Philip, and I'm Jan. I can't, Jan. I can't get a picture up, but I, you can hear me. I can, I can hear, hear you. We can hear you, Jan. Thank you, and I could hear you. Very interesting. Many years ago, the 75th anniversary of Gallipoli, I was involved with a class doing research into family members who'd served in World War One, and one was Percy Lay. I think he came was a. You probably heard of him. Yeah, Percy was a very good friend of Ern's. Right, and he was in Dunsterville. And I understood that the reason they went basically was partly humanitarian, that um, it was, uh, you know, because of the famine, etc., in the area. He didn't get to Siberia, but he was uh, in that. Would that be correct? That it That's was true. Most basically humanitarian? Well, uh, that, that came to the fore when they realised the ethnic cleansing was underway further yeah, for up. Armenia. Um, uh, the Armenians and the Assyrians. There, there's quite a large population of Assyrians um, who all, they both evacuated. On top of that, there was a famine in Persia anyway, just because of the complete incompetence of the Persian government. Um, and uh, someone mentioned earlier the recent book about the Armenian and Australian um, uh, work in World War One, and that particularly doubles down on the uh, on the uh, uh, the the humanitarian support. Um, but I don't think that they, when they first pulled Dunster Force together, they realized the magnitude of the humanitarian force. I think it was a political motivation first, but the humanitarian work became front of mind. And you can see that in Ern's letters as he describes, you know, trying to feed these people with their own supplies and so forth. That must have been dreadful. And interesting to know that you're related to Eric Sake who was a very close friend of my father's. And I knew one daughter has died, but Jenny, Jenny's sake um, still comes to the 
when we have them, Rusi lunches at the end of the year. She's married to a ex. John Beatty, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Je- so Jenny's, Jenny's my favorite. Jenny's my favorite cousin. But oh, Ern's, right. Uh, uh, um, she's so funny. Um, but Ern's mother and Eric's mother were sisters. That's right. Uh, uh-huh. That's that's the connection there. Um, and as I said, I think one of the great uh, war artists of World War Two, among other things. Very much so. Quite yes, and underrated. I mean, you don't see a lot of him. Although I think um, his Christmas cards and things bring quite a bit at auction. Absolutely. Are there any um, thank you. It was very good. Sorry. Sorry, I just I, I thought you'd finished, Jan. I have. I Thank you, see. but I had to say that to, about Eric. <laughs> yeah, it's all fine. He was uh, a, a official any... war artist for the RAAF. Are there any more questions? Mark, um, um, I think I might have missed it. Your grandfather left the military under those situations where he was a colonel on retirement, yeah. I guess. Uh, yeah, he was a lieutenant. He was a, when he was appointed CEO of um, the small arms school. Uh, he was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, oh, I should know, uh, late 30s, and he took full Colonel um, yeah. uh, upon retirement, is my understanding. I think it's Colonel on the barracks. Uh, and and your father, from memory, ended up training commander? No, uh, Dad's last job was uh, actually head of the National Disasters Organisation, uh, uh, right. which was, do you remember, after Darwin, or before Darwin, they actually had... Um, set up a military-led approach to natural disasters, which I think they're bringing back. Um, and Dad, Dad followed right. Alan Stratton in that role. All uh, right. That was his last role in the military. And um, the story of your grandfather's is almost a, like a, a boy's own journey. It must have been incredibly difficult. I know they're an armed force, therefore you had respect in that part of the world, but the countries were collapsing and uh, they must have just lived on ingenuity and initiative and got things done and stayed out of serious trouble for, for a long time. And, and look, they used some, uh, you know, they, they, their processes, I think, were, were appropriate for the time. But there's a funny article, I think, in, in Reveille between the wars when Ern wrote out his, some of his stories um, about how, you know, some traditional British army officers came up to Hamadan and, were absolutely surprised about the, the 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 processes that Ern used to train the Armenians, and it wasn't wasn't proper British process. But um, uh, uh, Ern and his British colleague gave, uh, gave them uh, the hierarchy some marching orders and told them to. They have been looking on. for the mess, I suppose. <laughs> Which didn't. Um, there's a there's a comment question from Leonor. Was the disquiet on the part of Urn or the Dennett's about Urn being in Europe fighting the Germans? Well, it's a good question, Leo, because uh, the Dennett's were part of the big German migration um, uh, into Australia in the 1850s as well. So um, Linda was uh, a granddaughter of a German migrant. Um, up to the war, you know, they were Lutherans and they swapped to Presbyterians. So they, they um, but, uh, Ern's letters to his fiance uh, were quite derogatory about the Huns, which is not unusual for letters from the front, I think. And there they didn't seem to be too much um, uh, pushback. Uh, uh, whether they approved of their only daughter marrying uh, an army officer doing that, uh, hard to tell. I don't have any correspondence from even Linda, let alone um, her parents. But... Um, uh, yeah, he, he certainly didn't pull any punches in describing uh, his view of German so-called atrocities uh, back to his, um, his in-laws. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. It's David here. A question about the two VCs that were one at Archangel. Uh, are they regarded as Australian VCs or are they British VCs? Because the, at the time... The soldiers were members of the British Army, not the Australian Army. Uh, good question. I know they're listed. If you look at, um, if you go to the War Memorial, or if you read the um, the the book that collects all the Australian uh, awardees, they're included within that. Um, Pierce is the surname of one, and I can't think of the other. Um, uh, but so I, I suppose they're viewed. The fact that they're represented in in Canberra 
um, I suppose they're seen as being awarded to to Australians, but they're certainly counted in the hundred and one. Yeah. Australian VCs that are issued, and I, I've thought the same question. I don't know why, because there's been other Australians awarded VCs fighting in other services that haven't been included. So I don't know what made those two different. Well, it may come back to the configuration of um, how they were deployed. Were, were they sort of AIF within the British mission up there? Or I know one of them was killed, and um, you know the British, the Commonwealth War Graves talks about trying to find his um, his grave and so forth up there. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know the, the proper um, treatment of those two. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of books about that intervention. Um, one most recent is by yes. a, a British barrister, uh, a Melbourne barrister, uh, Challenger, is it, I think, or Challenger, something like that, um, about 10 years ago, 15, and that goes into great detail about the Australians in Murmansk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think but, but, sorry, one of those VC winners died in England in 1930s, hit by a, uh, somebody riding a bicycle on um, um, Rotten Row or whatever it is, where the, the horse riders are. Mm -hmm. He was in England for a, uh, a ceremony uh, representing all the VCs, and he was crossing the road, and got run over by a bicycle, and died. There you go. Isn't that my go? Um, I think we'll draw the, the evening to a close. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank that you. Tremendous. Look at, Mark. Thank you. If everyone Thank wants you. to hear more, you know, the, uh, I've, I've included the, the links on the web. You can, uh, you can source it from the printer in Adelaide, or if anyone wants to contact me directly, I'm happy to ship one down. This was a labour of love, and um, I, I love telling the story, and i um, more than happy to get some copies out um, uh, from my supply here if anyone's interested. Yes, and, and so thank you very much. And that sort of brings me to the the, the usual messages at the close. Um, clearly, uh, in addition to giving a, a, a wonderful speech, Mark is selling books. We'll be sending out information about um, how you a, a, uh, can do that. And we'll also be sending out another three minute feedback survey. And please answer that. We get a lot of um, information from that and we act on it. Uh, there's a couple of notices for coming events. The next speaker will be anthropologist Professor Christine Halliwell, who will be talking on the secret World War II Australian operation in Borneo, in which the native Dayak headhunters are, were recruited to help beat the Japanese. So that'll be very interesting. That's on Wednesday, the 8th of September on Zoom again. And uh, we also have um, a one-day conference coming up, the Bloody Beachheads, the battles for Gona, Buna and San Ananda. This is a, hopefully, well, this is a face-to-face -face conference. Let's hope that we, um, the problems with uh, COVID doesn't, don't get worse. And that'll be held on Saturday, 2nd of October at the Waverley RSL in Glen Waverley. Um, and with this, we're, that brings the evening to a close. Thanks very much, Mark. That was tremendous. Um, great slide. Yeah, yeah. And thanks also to, to Jason who keeps, keeps everything going behind the scenes. And thank you all for joining us. Hope you come again. And uh, good night to you from the committee and myself. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. It's been a great honor having us. Yeah, it's been tremendous, Mark. Thanks.